sponsored by GISA Credit Union, and their sponsorship includes the opportunity to speak to our group about their company. And representing GISA today is their president and CEO, Christina Leffling. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to say a few words on behalf of GISA today. And uh, once again, GISA, GISA is delighted to sponsor today's Chamber of Commerce luncheon. Building a strong business community in Tri-Cities is crucial to maintaining and growing our economy in Eastern Washington. I think you'd all agree with that. Like today's keynote speaker, GISA Credit Union is also impacting the world through innovation. In fact, we've also just been recognized by the Credit Union Times for being a trailblazer in the area of lending. So that was an award received actually by Brett Jorgensen, our Senior Vice President of Lending, who is here today with us. If you want to stand up for just a minute, Brett, we recognize. We're very proud of Brett and um, everyone on our lending team for all that they do for our members and for our area and for GISA Credit Union. You know, as the area's lender of choice, we have supported the communities we serve with over $517 million and affordable loans provided to our members in just 2011 alone. We offer local full service lending, including business loans. In addition, our members enjoy auto, home, student loans, home equity loans, and of course our, our low rate Visa credit cards as well. We know we've achieved our lending successes and recognition through personal service and modern convenient technology, like online lending. When business and local consumers have access to affordable loans, they're able to create economic and job growth for our region. We look forward to continuing our partnership with organizations like the Regional Chamber and local businesses like many of you in the room today to help grow our communities. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about GISA Credit Union and uh, also you have something right in front of you that tells you a little bit more about our services and we have lots of folks here from GISA who would love to tell you a little bit more about what we can do for you and help your business grow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, and thanks to Gisa again, a longtime supporter of the Chamber and as well as many other organizations in the Tri-Cities. It's now my pleasure to introduce John Crook, the chair of our board, to lead us through today's program. John? Thanks, Lori. Um, well, I wanted to start out today by uh, giving uh, Lori Matson uh, a kudo. She's uh, playing injured today. She um, had a little run in with the dentist this morning and it was touch and go. We took her back to the trainer's room. We shot her up. She's ready to play today. <laughs> so um, she's um, really putting forth a great effort. Um, and it's exciting to have PNL here today. Um, my wife, uh, also known as the reluctant Mrs. Crook, uh, actually works for the lab and uh, as a, in an auditor's position. And I was trying to come up with um, an auditor's joke before Mike came up, and um, there just are no auditor's jokes. So. <laughs> uh, let's move on, on to the um, our members, new members this month. Um, Camille, would you like to come up, please? afterwards also. No. Uh, today we have some outstanding businesses to introduce as new chamber members. As I read your names, please come forward to receive your membership plaque. Please stand at the front until all names have been read. Dr. Adam Buxbaum with Buxbaum Family Chiropractic. Lynn Chandler with Columbia Energy. Mike Leverton with Leverton Life. Lindy and Dan Anderson with MedNet. Melissa Simmons with MMEC Architecture and Interiors. Lyle Dedeker with RC Engineering, and Ted Erb with Solo Flight. Please join me in welcoming these new members to the chamber. It's exciting to see 
see so many new members join the chamber. It's also exciting to see many of our longtime loyal members renewing their cham chamber memberships for over 20 years. While they may not be here today, we'd like to acknowledge their dedication to the chamber. Their support allows us to provide programs that, so that strengthen our local business community. These businesses renewed their uh, memberships in March. Perfection Pittsburgh Paint, Tri-City Herald, Kennewick Irrigation District, Tri-Cities Community Federal Credit Union, Color Press, Mulvey Hill Insurance, and Clearwater Demo. If you have a business that you'd like to nominate for chamber membership, or if you're a guest interested in information on membership, please see me after the luncheon. Thank you. Thanks, Camille, and uh, welcome to all of our new members. Tri-Cities is truly fortunate to have the Pacific Northwest National Lab, a world-class research and development facility located right here in our backyard. The lab employs approximately 4,000 scientists, engineers, and support professionals, making Battelle the largest employer in the Tri-Cities. PNNL is a strong community advocate building relationships, generating goodwill, and has invested in more than $18 million in the Tri-Cities community to improve science, education, and our quality of life. Mike Clues is the Pacific Northwest National Director, uh, Laboratory Director, operated by Battelle for the U.S. Department of Energy. He is also Senior Vice President of Battelle. Mike is responsible for setting the vision and strategic direction of PNNL. Since assuming the helm in January 2007, he has focused PNNL on advancing the frontiers of science and solving some of our nation's most complex challenges in energy, the environment, and national security. He combines excellence in science and technology, management and operations, and community stewardship to ensure PNNL's world-class research and development. Mr. Clues joined Battelle at its Columbus corporate headquarters in 1976 as a defense and space system science specialist. He quickly moved up through the management ranks, serving as vice president of Battelle's defense engineering business and vice president and general manager of Battelle's Navy sector. Mr. Kluse then moved to PNNL in 1997 to lead PNNL's national security business, which he greatly enhanced the scope, impact, and number of clients. Mr. Kluse serves on the board of several regional and national organizations. Please help me to welcome Mike Kluse. Thank you, John. Um, talk about auditor's jokes. There is one. You know, our, our former head of audit used to have this saying, right? He, and my team knows this well. He'd show up at your doorstep and say, you know what? I'm not in the good news business. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is he was serious. Anyway, but you're right. There aren't many, aren't, aren't many uh, auditor jokes. Well, you know, it's really a, a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon, and I want to thank for thank you all for the invitation to speak. Even though PNL has been existence in an existence since 1965, you know, many people right here in our own community don't really know what we do. Uh, many of you think we're just part of the area, right? That we're working on Hanford cleanup, and while the work that we do does in fact support the Hanford mission, we are distinctly different. We're not Hanford. You know, the funding for Hanford that you read about, and there was an article in this morning's paper about the expected funding in the, in the current budget, um, and that funding is roughly about $2 billion a year. It doesn't include any funding for the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. You know, our annual budget is roughly a billion dollars, and, uh, but it's composed of nearly 2,000 projects, and each one of those projects has to be renewed each and every year. So unlike the, the, the cleanup effort, our mission is not finite, uh, and when a day comes that the site is cleaned up and the jobs of the Hanford contractors are done, we'll still be here. So PNL is the enduring federal asset in this community. And as I said earlier, innovation and technology is our business. So we advance scientific discovery and we deliver solutions in energy, 
environment and a national security. And the work that we do and the partnerships that we have are helping move the technologies out of the lab and into the real world. And these technologies are helping protect the prosperity, help protect the safety and the security of our nation. So before I get too far, I want to tell you my definitions of innovation and technology, at least for the purposes of, of the discussion we're going to have here in the next 30 minutes. So here we go. So innovation is a, it's a unique concept. It's a fresh new idea. It's ingenuity, it's creativity, it's originality. Technology is a novel solution that can be developed as a result of that innovation. It could be a gadget, an actual prototype of something you can touch and feel, or it can be an improved chemical reaction, a more efficient process, a better material. So in short, it's, it's the innovation that's ready to be put to use in, in, in one way or another. So today what I'm going to do is talk about some of the great examples of innovation and technology and describe for you how the two go hand in hand. Innovation really is the key to economic security, to environmental security, and to energy security. But you know, it takes innovation and technology. It takes discovery and it takes deployment to really make an impact. So I was asked to describe what happens to technologies after they leave the lab. And that's not always a simple answer. And certainly there's not a one-size-fits-all description of that process. So I'm going to do my best to give you an idea of how a few of the technologies that we've helped develop are making a, a difference in the world and how they moved from the laboratory into the marketplace. So I'm also going to share a few lessons that we've learned along the way. There's some key concepts that we think have been critical to a number of our past successes. And we want to incorporate these same concepts as we approach opportunities well into the future. And so finally, I'm going to touch on a few exciting things that are happening right here in our community, efforts that I believe are going to fuel innovation and technology and economy going forward here in our own community. So successful technologies require innovation from the beginning to the end. So before I start describing some examples of success, let me tell you it's not easy. It's not easy to move an idea or an innovation from its earliest beginnings as a concept in a researcher's mind into a viable technology and, and to be able to then to deploy it into the real world. There's a lot of challenges along the way. It takes creativity, it takes tenacity, and it can feel like trying to push a rock uphill. It often takes as much innovation to keep the promising technology moving forward as it did to develop the, the, the technology in the first place. I'm sure you're well aware that the, the folks in the technology industries and the venture, cap, venture capital world call it the valley of death, and they call it that for a reason. And certainly at the laboratory, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons over the years, and we're trying to learn from our mistakes, build on our successes, and continually shorten the time and the expense it takes to move from development to deployment. So I'm going to tell you three success stories. And for each one, what I'll try to do is work in some of the key concepts of our approach that help these technologies move out of the laboratory and to move forward. And as I mentioned before, success can come in, in many different flavors. Some are based on long-standing, ongoing partnerships. Some technologies move very quickly to the market to full deployment. Some are the result of years spent on a cycle of developing, enhancing, and improving the technology until it's ready for prime time. And some, some are at the front edge of success, where we've entered into a new relationship with a company who is licensing a technology with plans to commercialize it. So this first example really demonstrates the strength of long-term relationships and the value of working together uh, focused on a common outcome. But it's also a story about a solution moving very quickly to full deployment. So over the years, we've done a lot of work at the laboratory in support of Archer Daniels Midland, who, as you know, is a global leader in agricultural processing. And much of this work has been in chemistry research and development that's related to catalyst and bio-based products. So when they approached us with a specific technical challenge and performance requirements related to the production of a widely used chemical called propylene glycol, we understood the challenge and we understood their needs. And we quickly joined them as partners of a team that's focused on the same end goal. So this wasn't the case of the lab developing a technology and then trying to find it a home. In this case, 
the innovation moved from concepts scribbled down on a whiteboard to begin with to full-scale technology deployment in a commercial production plant in a matter of a few short years. So I'm going to let this video tell the story for me. Paint, printer ink cartridges, plastics, cosmetics. These are a few of the thousands of common industrial and consumer products manufactured using a chemical called propylene glycol. Each year, more than 2 billion pounds of petroleum are consumed to meet the current demand for the chemical. Now, a new process developed by researchers at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington, offers a commercially proven, cost-effective way to make propylene glycol from renewable sources. Development of the innovative process began in the early 2000s with a series of collaborations that resulted in a new set of catalysts and the discovery that glycerol could be converted to propylene glycol. This meant that what was once made from a petroleum-based process could be produced entirely using a renewable feedstock, raw materials such as corn, sugarcane, and soybean. Archer Daniels Midland Company, a global leader in agricultural processing, teamed with PNNL researchers to optimize the catalysts for commercial applications. After validating the concept, ADM licensed the technology with plans to commercially produce the chemical solely from renewable sources. In 2010, ADM completed construction and commissioning of our glycol plant here in Decatur, Illinois. The plant has a capacity of 100,000 metric tons. Third-party studies have also shown that our product has a 61% greenhouse gas reduction in comparison to the petroleum analog. This allows our customers to reduce their carbon footprint. The new multi-million dollar facility is the first of many expected to follow, significantly reducing petroleum use in the production of industrial propylene glycol. Today, the ADM and PNNL collaboration continues as both organizations forge ahead to pioneer new ways of responsibly producing valuable chemicals that respect the earth and its inhabitants. Remarkable story, success story, when you think that it was about a four to five year period from the original requirement when we first began to uh, collaborate with, with ADM to full-scale commercial production. Quite a, quite a compressed timeline. So now, uh, the next story is, is one of my favorites, and in part because the technology was developed for one very specific application, but it's found a set of totally different uses. And I'm sure many of you heard of this one, or at least pieces of it before, but this is such an amazing story that I just have to share it with you again. So one of our researchers at the laboratory uh, named Doug McMakin and many of you probably know Doug, uh, has dedicated nearly two decades of his career to developing one technology. And it's uh, an approach to use safe radio frequency waves called millimeter wave technology to use it in security scanners. And these scanners can detect plastic weapons or plastic or liquid explosives that would go undetected by today's metal detectors that you see in the airports. So Doug is an electrical engineer, and he can probably tell you a whole lot about the ins and outs and the ups and downs that can take place in the process, the elaborate process of moving a technology out of the laboratory. And I'm sure that as he sat in his electrical engineering courses in college, he might have been thinking about what, what kind of a career he would pursue, but I'm guessing he probably never considered that he'd have to be way more than an engineer. He'd also have to be part salesman, part marketing expert, part relationship manager, all this to ensure that the technology that he developed would reach its fullest potential, not one, but two or three different applications. But today, you know, thanks to Doug's efforts and PNL's commercialization team and, and others at the laboratory, a company called L3 Communications is actively marketing an enhanced version of this technology it calls ProVision. So in October of last year, the Transportation Security Administration purchased 300 ProVision screening systems from L3. This is a $44.8 million order. And this new version highlights the location of potential threats on the image of a generic mannequin, not on a fuzzy holographic image of an actual person being scanned. So they've addressed passenger privacy concerns with the previous versions that many have read a lot about. So in addition to the new order, 250 existing ProVision units in about 40 U.S. airports are getting this image-free upgrade. 
So between those in the United States and similar systems in Europe and Asia, L3 Communications has sold more than 900 of, the, 900 of these screening systems worldwide. So you wonder, how did this all come about? Well, here's a little bit of history. P&L started working with the Federal Aviation Administration to perform feasibility studies related to the potential use of using this approach in airport security back in 1989, so well before 9-11, 2001. I can actually remember viewing this technology, the early versions of this, when I was still based in Columbus in the early 90s. Our first patent was issued in 1995. But in the, in the year 2000, Safeview, which is a startup company that based its entire business plan around this technology, licensed it from the laboratory and worked with our researcher, researchers to build a security system around this concept. They call it the Safeview Scout System. Then in 2006, Safeview was acquired by L3 Communications. So this technology changed hands from, from the lab to a small startup company to a company that employs 61,000 people worldwide and re reports sales of more than 15 billion a year. And it's, today it's out there in airports, making the world a safer place. So chances are many have gone through one of these in your travels. If you haven't, you probably will as you, as you uh, enter more airports. Um, but you know, as they say in the info infomercials you see on TV, wait, there's more. So this same technology has also been licensed to a company in the apparel industry called Meality. Meality. And they aren't interested in detecting weapons or explosives, not at all. They're using the technology to take precise body measurements so that consumers can easily find off the rack clothes that will fit them perfectly. There's actually a mall in Philadelphia where you can have your body scanned and get these precise measurements. Though I suspect some of us may not want to know exactly how much our waistline has changed since the last time we saw a tape measure around our middle. But this, this same technology could also be used for health and fitness. So in a combination with a scale, the body scanner could provide a better sense of, of body composition and body mass index. So, you know, when I say that success comes in many different flavors, I guess this one might be something like Neapolitan, right? Because there's three flavors in one. And on a more serious note, you know, this example highlights the importance of seamless transitions. The technology has changed hands and been enhanced as it moved into worldwide deployment. So the roots of the technology date back to the 1960s when researchers at p &L, way before Doug's time, pioneered the development of optical and acoustic holography. And Doug had a vision of how it could uh, prove to be extremely valuable. And he was determined to make sure that it achieved its full potential. And today, this new, new tool, which is a tool on the war on terrorism, is being put to use around the world. And the very same technology is, is being applied, uh, applied in many different ways. So my third example is a, a lot more forward-looking than the previous two. So it's a collaboration with a startup company out of Maryland called Vorbeck. And the last two technologies I talked about are being commercialized by multi-billion dollar companies, well-established industry leaders, they're both on the New York Stock Exchange. ADM is, was founded 100 years ago. On the other hand, Vorbeck, who we're working with right now, has only been in business since 2006. And we just started working together with DOE funding. But you know that, those, these facts, don't make the, uh, the invention any less important, and it doesn't make the potential for success any less. It just means that the, tech, that the technology development and commercialization efforts are at earlier stages of the process. And it's another example of being outcome driven, sharing a common goal right from the very beginning. So I think you're well aware there's lots of critical needs for better batteries. Bringing down the cost and the performance, cost down, performance up is important to everything from cell phones to electric cars to the energy that's generated from those hundreds of windmills that you see when you drive between here and Portland. And every one of those applications has a different set of requirements when it comes to cost and performance. So at the laboratory, we have a discretionary pool of funds that we can invest in new capability. And we've invested our own money in a, an initiative called the Materials Transformation Initiative. And at the lab, we're seeing all kinds of promise, promising development in energy storage as a result of this investment. So it really comes down to, so what materials do you use? How do they perform? How much do they cost? How long do they last? And how you go about producing them? These challenges, challenges just so happen to align very well with some of the lab's fundamental sciences capabilities. So 
tackling them is really in one of the sweet spots of the laboratory. Now, Vorbeck is working with us to develop and commercialize PNL's method of building tiny chemical structures to greatly improve the performance of lithium ion batteries for laptops and for electric cars. So as you start looking at battery designs, there's usually a trade-off, a trade-off between the amount of energy a battery can store and how quickly it can recharge. And certainly as consumers, we want both. We want long life, we want quick recharge. Well, our researchers have been working with Vorbeck and they're also working with scientists at Princeton University. And they've demonstrated that adding small quantities of high quality graphene to battery materials can lead to batteries that store large amounts of energy and can in fact recharge quickly. So researchers from all three organizations see a real need and a real opportunity. And so they're collaborating to apply their respective areas of expertise to move an innovative energy storage technology forward. So the new material that's in Vorbex batteries stores twice as much as electricity at high charge and dis dis discharge rates as current lithium ion batteries. And according to our partner Vorbeck, this technology could cut cell phone uh, and tablet charge times to 10 minutes while providing 24 hours of use. And they say electric cars could travel 400 miles on a single charge rather than today's roughly 100 miles. So the promise of this technology was validated just a few months ago when Vorbeck was selected by the Department of Energy as America's next top energy innovator. So the collaboration truly is a, is a meeting of the minds. PNNL, Princeton University are pioneers in the, in the field of graphene-based battery electrodes. Vorbeck has leading expertise in the production and application of high-quality uh, high graphene. And everybody's working together through a cooperative research and development agreement, or a CRADA as we call it. And Vorbeck certainly has its sights set on rapidly commercializing the technology. In fact, they're already working with uh, a material and supply company to bring, the, bring these materials to market. So how long before you're gonna see these, these batteries built into the technology of, of your cell phones? Well, it's still a little, little too early to say. And could others beat us to the punch? Well, perhaps. But we believe that with the collective focus and an end goal in mind, and this commitment to work together, I think, uh, I think this team's got a great chance. So while each of these examples I just described are unique, they also have a number of things in common. And these are the things that we think will increase our chances of getting technologies into the hands of our clients, government and industry, and even into uh, our consumers like you and me, so they can act, actually improve our quality of life. And hopefully you picked up on some of these common themes, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-emphasize them. So certainly there's a need to be focused on outcomes, to fundamentally understand what problems need to be solved, and then figure out how to get the solution as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. There's a need to collaborate, to work as a team willing to leverage each other's strengths to reach a common goal. And there's a need to be flexible and work seamlessly within our own organizations and uh, with our partners. So we're incorporating these concepts into a more, uh, more formal model for commercialization success. So Mike Schwenk, who is seated here with us today, he's leading this effort for the laboratory. He's coined the term innovation-driven economic advantage. And being kind of a semi-government organization, we love acronyms, right? So we've shortened it and we call it the IDEA model, innovation-driven economic advantage. And it's all about being outcome driven, about being collaborative, about being seamless. And I want to describe each of these attributes in a little bit more detail. They really are making a difference at the laboratory. So outcome driven. At PNL, we've adopted an outcome driven approach to, to, to innovation. Not just in our approach to commercialization, but in a more general sense as well. So the question shouldn't be, all right, so where do we go get the next chunk of funding? It should be, what are the most important challenges that we can target? We have to think this way for the nation to get the most out of the federal research and development investments it makes, and you know those are huge. So we look for opportunities to align our work with industry and government needs. And we have to be able to answer questions, pretty fundamental questions like so what and who cares. And we found that by approaching our work in this way, at the laboratory we, we can more quickly move from ideas to outcomes. And the key here is linking our research agenda to our technology transfer agenda. And you know it's working. In the last several years, our laboratory has grown from about $600 million in, in annual budget to more than a billion dollars. And we're conducting game-changing science. Some of it's 
uh, focus primarily on uncovering new knowledge and understanding, and some of it's connected to the market by design, and it's making an impact. And I believe we're headed in the right direction. We're focused on the right things, and we're, we're ready to adjust and to adapt as new challenges arise and national priorities shift. And as you just heard, you know, being outcome driven is important in the process of commercializing technologies as well. So I think it applied to all three of the stories I shared with you, but especially true with ADM. You know, we fully understood the desired endpoint, a full-scale commercial plant using bio-based feedstock instead of petroleum-based one. We knew the technical requirements and the economic requirements, and we knew the time frame of interest. And then we started figuring out what it would take to get there. So let me talk about collaboration. You know, as a lab, we identify and target critical research and intellectual, par intellectual property partners. And we realize that the problems that this nation is facing today are too large for any one organization to address on its own. And it doesn't matter whether you're a national laboratory, whether you're a university, you're a government agency, you're a private company. You can't solve these problems on your own. You need collaboration and you need strong partnerships. So we look for it and we welcome it. And we look, we look for all kinds of opportunities to work together. So the battery project that I described with Vorbeck is a, is a perfect example of collaborative research. A private company, a university, a national laboratory, each with their own area of expertise, working together to make some significant advancements in battery technology. And, you know, we realize that collaborations can be as simple as scientists from two organizations working together to conduct research and publish the results. Collaborations can be consortia that bring multiple organizations together. They can be joint R&D projects with industry partners. And they can be government-sponsored cooperative research and development agreements, CRADAs. But regardless of the size or the type, collaboration is about working together towards a common goal. And each party usually brings something unique to the table. That's when it works best. National labs like ours have fundamental science uh, capabilities and we draw, uh, that we draw upon. And we draw upon those even when we're developing applied solutions like you heard about in these three examples. We also have unique facilities that don't, that don't exist anywhere else in the world. And we can take a multidisciplinary approach because we put together teams of researchers that represent our breadth and uh, depth of capabilities. And I think you also appreciate that uh, collaborations also take commitment and take, take compromise, which really leads us to this third, this third uh, attribute, and that's seamless. Now this one can be tricky for us sometimes because the truth is we are, in our core, we're a government laboratory. That means we're responsible to the federal government and to you, you know, the nation's taxpayers. Sometimes that means layers of bureaucracy that, can, that can't be avoided. And despite how much we'd like to move at the speed of business, it's not always possible. But I know we've lived through examples uh, when innovative ideas or promising business concepts have died on the vine. And quite, quite honestly, it's often been our own fault. We've gotten in our own way, taking way too long to, to, to make decisions, being flexible, inflexible, or forgetting uh, the big picture and getting bogged down in the details. And our partners range from small startup companies to global industry leaders. And so for some, you know, the entire R&D department and the legal department could share one of these tables in this room. And for others, just the board of directors and the top executives would more than fill this room. So we can't expect everybody to conform to our way of doing business. We have to be nimble, we have to be flexible, and we have to be adaptable. We have to work, we have to make it work with whomever our partner is. So at PNL, we're taking steps to increase the efficiency of our business processes, to reduce the red tape, speed up decision making and to optimize research productivity and working together with the other national laboratories to, to do the same thing. So we realize that we have to act responsibly, responsibly, but we can't let perfect get in the way of good. And by that I mean that we can't sit back and watch an opportunity in the rear view mirror because we're working so long and hard on the nitty gritty terms of a contract as, as one example. So commercialization requires us to take risks and it requires us to move relatively fast. There's never a guarantee for success, and, but we have to manage the risk. And we can't play it so safe that we aren't making any progress. So looking at uh, the idea model in general, we're, we're trying to be more systematic in the way that we connect R&D, tech transfer, and deployment. We seek opportunities for investment to tie together funded research with the intellectual property landscape. We build technology roadmaps that include deployment plans. And we look for partnerships and mechanisms to link technology transfer to deployment, including economic development support, financing, 
and changes on the policy, policy or regulatory front. So before I close though, I want, I want to talk a little bit about some success stories that originated a little closer here to home. As you know, PNNL is a, is a national lab. We're expected and required to make national impact, but we're also part of this community. And consider, consider that the vast majority of PNNL's nearly 4,700 staff members live and work right here in the Tri-Cities or in the surrounding area. Sure, they, they take the contributions that they make in their professional lives seriously, but they're also leaders in the community as mentors, as coaches, and as volunteers. So we want to see all of our friends and neighbors and our local and regional businesses succeed. And as an, as an organization, PNNL wants to do our part to help diversify and strengthen the economy in the Tri-Cities and around the Northwest. So I have a few examples of how the laboratory has helped companies from our region solve technical challenges and move good ideas to the next level. Some draw upon our te te technical assistance program, which aims to help businesses start, to grow, to diversify, and sometimes helps create new jobs right here in the Northwest. So the first example is a business whose technology and first employees originated at P&L. So in 1995, three of our entrepreneurial researchers spun out on a new venture. They licensed a melting or vitrification technology for transforming processed waste materials into rich sources of clean, renewable fuels. And across the, the entire DOE complex, this kind of waste was typically just incinerated, burned, and it's gone. But these guys, these guys were looking for an alternative, and they came up with a concept for the plasma-enhanced melter technology. They thought it could be applicable to more than just DOE waste. And they didn't start from scratch. Between the efforts at PNL and MIT, so there's another university, about $300 million in research funding had been invested in glass melter technology and in plasma technology. So PNL researchers and their collaborators at MIT and DOE brought everything together. They integrated the proprietary plasma technology with existing glass melter technology. Then through PNL's entrepreneurial leave of absence program, the PNL researchers created a spin-off company named InNTech, and some of you know this company, InNTech, to commercialize the technology. And the PNL scientists and engineers continued to, to help advance the plasma enhanced melter technology. The result is a process that, is, that successfully uses plasma or hot ionized gas to break down waste at the molecular level. These molecular components can then be reformed into a gas that can be used as a fuel or as a building block to make other clean liquids uh, or chemicals. The overall volume of the waste that needs to be dealt with is reduced and the waste that's left over is converted to stable glass-like form that can be used in things like paving materials. So in -end tech systems are now installed around the world at municipal, medical, and hazardous waste sites. I know this because I see Jeff Surma, who is the, the president of Inantech, I see him at the airport on airplanes all the time. Yeah, he's one of the researchers that spun out of the laboratory. So he and his partners are in the business of building and operating the processing plants and selling the output for producing methanol, ethanol, diesel, industrial chemicals, and, and hydrogen. So the research, researchers at the lab took a chance at this promising, promising technology, took a chance it could stand on its own, stand alone on its own, and by God it is. So in this next example, uh, you'll see how a little technical assistance can transform a, a good idea into a new technology with, uh, with a solid business concept. So engineers from Hydrovolts, which is a Seattle-based renewable energy company, have been working with our engineers and with our environmental experts. They're designing and developing a turbine that produces clean, renewable energy using predictable and controlled water currents currents like those found in canals, in water treatment plants, and other artificial waterways. So initially, Hydrovolts was interested in pursuing tidal power, and I think you're aware that they're not the only ones. The Department of Energy and a number of private companies around the world are looking uh, at the potential of harnessing the energy in ocean waves as a new source of power. In fact, some of our researchers at SQUIM, we operate a marine sciences laboratory over on the Olympic Peninsula in SQUIM, they're working on a project for DOE that's focused on addressing the environmental performance needs related to tidal power and underwater turbines. And our sensor fish technology, which has got a lot of publication or, or publicity here locally, uh, has been used to collect data about what happens to salmon as they migrate past the Columbia and Snake River dams. 
This technology could also be used to design more fish-friendly underwater turbines. But as you can imagine, the, uh, the challenge of capturing the power of waves underwater and offshore can prove quite, quite difficult from both a technical and from an environmental perspective. So after a series of free technology assistant projects with experts at the laboratory, Hydrovolts is now going in a different direction. They've shifted their strategy and they're commercializing small portable floating turbines that harvest power of free flowing water and can produce enough energy to charge a cell phone or a computer. And they can be chained together to meet community scale energy needs. So just think, think about how much of the world still has no electricity. It's, it's, it's quite, quite, a, quite a number. And how challenging it is to provide electricity to remote locations where there isn't any infrastructure for power generation or transmission. So these turbines are about the size of a small car and it can deliver not only electricity but a complete change in the quality of life for rural villages in third world countries. So investigators have, have, have agreed to back hydrovolts. They've got, they've got backing, financial backing. They see promise in the uh, solid business model and the innovative technology and our laboratory helps shape both. So the company's moving into full-scale commercialization of its turbines and plans to add canal installations in the U.S. around the world. So I have one more example. And uh, this highlights the importance of finding a seamless handshake between development and deployment. So here's a quick story about a technology began at the lab is now being used in the real world. Energy Expert is a commercially available energy software tool that monitors energy use in buildings and detects and alerts building managers to anomalies. It's based on a technology that was developed at PNNL called the Whole Building Energy Diagnostician. Northright, the name of the company, licensed the technology from PNNL. But they didn't just take it and run with it. They continue to work with our researchers, some of it free of cost through our technology assistance program, and together they, they enhance the tool, converting it to a web-based application and getting, getting it ready for actual end users. Another great example of, uh, of collaboration and, and partnering in something that's making a difference right here in the community. So, you know, it's really nice to be able to live in a, in a region and a community that, that shares the commitment to nurturing an innovation-driven economy. I think we all agree it's critical to our future. And you know, might be aware of the unique partnership that we have with Washington State University, Tri-Cities over at Bessel, the Bioproduct Science and Engineering Laboratory. This truly is a one-of-a-kind partnership between the state of Washington, between WSU Tri-Cities, between uh, DOE and PNNL. So together with a, a joint commitment to teaching and research, we build a new facility that's focused on converting biomass to fuels and, and other value-added chemicals and products. We couldn't have done this on our own. But by leveraging our assets and our complementary capabilities, we now have a $24 million building and we're collaborating on long-term energy solutions for the state and for the nation. So the lab, along with many partners from around the Tri-Cities in the region, is also part of two distinctive and collaborative efforts to bring together the strengths of this community, to advance innovation and to advance technology, and at the same time to, to, to hopefully boost our local economy. One is the Tri-City Research District. It's a 1,700 acre area in North Richland that includes PNNL, WSU Tri-Cities, the Port of Benton, Hanford Contractors, federal and state agencies, and about 80 businesses. So this effort is led by a board that represents folks from across the community. In fact, our own Gary Spanner has served as chair since the group started about five years ago. The Tri-City Research Dis District is striving to provide access to the technical, labor, and capital resources that technology companies need to develop, commercialize, and market their products globally. One of this group's main goals is to assist existing property owners to develop and market their properties in a coordinated and a cooperative way. They're reaching out to new and expanding technology, research, and light manufacturing for firms. And these are the kind of companies that could create new non-Hanford non family wage jobs and help diversify our local economy. So in 2008, Battelle co-founded a master plan for the core research district along with private and public partners. Battelle is also providing $100,000 to fund the operations of the Tri-City Research District for three years. So for the last couple of years, the group has been executing on this master plan to create a community. They call it an innovation ecosystem that includes mixed-use facilities with a focus on sustainability. 
So if you take a dri drive around that part of town today, you're going to see street improvements, new buildings, new construction. It's pretty exciting after many, many years of planning. And in fact, PNL is the, the first and the largest occupant of the Innovation Center at the Tri-City Research District. And this development is just south of our main campus, just south of Battelle Boulevard. We occupy all three floors of the systems engineering uh, facility, and that's at the corner of University Drive and Einstein Avenue. PNL continues to help, with re help the research district by co-hosting potential investors and developers and recruiting prospects. And the other group I want to mention is Mid-Columbia Energy Initiative. This is an effort that's being coordinated by TRIDEC to transfer a little over 1,600 acres of federal land on the Hanford site to the community for future economic development. So this initiative is in fact focused on econom economic development that capitalizes on our local infrastructure, our resources, and our expertise primarily in the energy sector. They're focused on transforming the Tri-Cities into an energy hub and a leading economic development force within the state. So their goal is to provide clean, sustainable energy solutions to the community, to the state, and to the nation, leading the way to national ener energy independence. So PNL serves in a number of leadership roles for this group as well. Mike Schwenk, again, chaired the, the organization for its first two years. Becky Jones provided project control support to help organize the effort, and Peter Christensen from our commercialization office serves as the chair of the Smart Grid, Smart Grid Working Group. So at the laboratory, we continue to seek and jointly respond to potential funding opportunities and continue to work on this initiative. So with the support of DOE, PNL installed a 175,000 kilowatt solar collector array with charging stations for a dozen electric vehicles on our campus. And not surprisingly, you're going to see a lot of the same, uh, same names on these two groups' membership lists. So you'll see uh, they're the people in the organizations who embrace the challenges of innovation and the challenges of technology development and deployment. They're, they're great ambassadors for this area. They understand the strengths of the community. They understand the importance of collaboration and the benefits of getting technologies into the real world so they can solve real world challenges. And you know, these benefits extend well beyond our local, local economy. They really extend to the society as a whole. So I hope that everybody sitting in this room considers themselves to be ambassadors of this community. And hopefully you'll stand behind PNL and what we're trying to do as well. You know, this state is known for its innovation economy, and PNL and the Tri Cities are part of that. But unfortunately, I think you all realize that when people on the West Side think of innovation, we typically don't come to mind. They think first and foremost about Boeing, about Microsoft, about the University of Washington, about Amazon. So we, we need to, to, to raise the awareness of all the assets, all the resources that we have here in this community. So take a quick look at a few facts here. So there's nearly 5,000 people at the lab doing more than a billion dollars of business that's really make, making a national impact each and every day. You know, there's only 17 national laboratories, 17 DOE national laboratories, and our state is very fortunate to have one, even if it's on this side of the state. Uh, but, you know, our research budget at a billion dollars is just behind the University of Washington's. And, and when you consider that more than 40% of the University of Washington's research awards are associated with our medical school, the work that we're doing in energy, environment, and national security really exceeds that that's being done at, at, at the University of Washington. So we, we can't be ignored. And, we can't, and the impact that this laboratory is making can't be ignored. So we can't compare to Microsoft. We can't compare to a Boeing when it comes to the number of people we employ. But consider this, we are about the same size as Seattle's 10th largest employer, which is Nordstrom. And according to TriDEC, we are the Tri-City's largest single employer. So clearly we, the collective we, the laboratory, the community needs to be part of the ongoing national dialogue about innovation. We're innovators and we're contributing significantly to the innovation economy. So today I talked about technologies we've, had li we've licensed to our industrial partners. You know, we have about 340 active licenses today. We have 23 active cooperative research and development agreements that are in place. And in one way or another, whether it's our technology, our personnel, or our assistance programs, nearly 150 companies have their roots traced back to PNNL. So I hope that as you interact with your colleagues, your business associates, you'll speak up about the strengths of this community. 
This community has a national lab. It has a four-year university. It's got plenty of available land. It's got intellectual capital. It's got multi modern infrastructure. And we have people with a vision and a commitment to work together to move innovations forward in advanced technologies. So I'd like to, uh, to uh, close with a quote that I think helps sums up the challenge. And as some of you know, uh, and as John mentioned, I have a national security background. I led the laboratory's national security director for about 10 years before becoming a laboratory director. And certainly I'm, I'm very grateful to those who serve our country. In fact, my oldest son's an Air Force pilot who's flown more than 140 combat missions over Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I'm obviously proud and I'm obviously grateful. And I believe we can learn an awful lot from those who lead our military and are responsible for defending our nation. So I'd like to quote Hyman Rickover, who was a Navy four-star admiral. He was the inventor and uh, the manager of the, the Navy nuclear propulsion program, which has had a dramatic impact on our military. Admiral Rickover said once, good ideas and innovations must be driven into existence by courageous practice. And, and every day, I see reasons to believe it. I see it at PNNL, I see it in the community, and I see it throughout the United States. Thanks very much. We've got time for a couple of quick questions for Mike. Quiet, quiet group. <laughs> You're too thorough. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Actually, I have a question for Mike. Um, as many of you know, the chamber plans to do our good health is good business. Uh, challenge this summer, and um, we need to measure some bodies. Um, <laughs> if you guys could let us loan that for a couple of months, that'd be pretty good. Um, once again, um, I'd like to thank Gisa Credit Union for sponsoring our luncheon, Charter Communications for taping our luncheon, and the Red Lion for their hospitality. If uh, Heather Hoppy would come up, uh, there she is. Uh, and join me, we'll give away our door prizes for today. Am I drawing? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon. I have four items to give away today. Um, the first one is from Country Gentleman Restaurant and Catering, and it's a catered lunch for eight. And it is Ted Herb with Solo Flight. Double win. Next, we have a gift certificate for a canister of Spark donated by Doug and Cam Gross with Advocare. And that's West Door with Doors Jewelry. Um, next, a 60-minute massage and soothing bath salts from Myers Therapeutic Massage. And that's Brandon Wilm with Design West Architects. And lastly, we have a gift basket from starspangledgifts.com. And that's print with <coughs> Century Securities. Thank you to all our member businesses who donated this month. And if you're interested in donating a door prize for future luncheons, just see me um, after the program. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Thank you Heather. Before we adjourn, I'd like to remind you that next month on May 23rd, uh, the Chamber will be hosting our annual State of the Cities luncheon right here uh, back at the Pasco Red Lion. Um, thank you all for attending today. And uh, remember, it is good business to do business with regional chamber members. Thanks a lot.